Let's talk about inference for one proportion. Here I'm going to introduce the topic and we'll work through some of the formulas and the underlying logic and I'll do an example in another video. So for this example, just to introduce the topic though, we have a telephone poll of 1,000 adult Americans and 440 say they approve of the way the president is handling his job. So this is a very, very common opinion poll that is done very, very frequently in the United States and they typically talk to about 1,000 people. And so what we have here is the sample proportion is our p hat. Call that p hat the sample proportion, and that is simply 440 over 1,000, the observed proportion in that sample of 1,000 individuals. And p hat, the sample proportion, estimates the population proportion p. So p hat estimates p. p hat is a statistic. P is a parameter. The true proportion of adult Americans that would say this if every adult American was contacted in this way. So our possible points of interest here to construct a confidence interval for P, the population proportion, a confidence interval for that parameter, and possibly test a hypothesis about the value of P if that's a point of interest to us in a given situation. To do any of that statistical inference, we need to know something about the sampling distribution of our statistic p hat. And p hat, well, one thing we know is that its expectation, the expectation of p hat is just p. It's not too difficult to show this mathematically. On average, p hat equals p. On average, the sample proportion equals the population proportion. And so p hat we say is an unbiased estimator of the population proportion p. The sampling distribution has a variance, and that variance can be worked out mathematically fairly easily to be this. So this is our variance of the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. And one of the things that you might notice here is that actually involves the true value of the parameter, which we don't know. The true value of P we do not know typically, and so this is going to pose an issue for us, and we're going to have to deal with that in a couple of different ways. And if we simply take the square root of the variance, we end up with the standard deviation. So my standard deviation of the sampling distribution of P hat is the square root of P times 1 minus P over N. What about the shape? of the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. Well, here I've illustrated the sampling distribution of the sampling proportion p hat when n is 20 and p is 0.5. And what you might notice is this actually looks reasonably normal. That's a pretty squiggly normal curve that I have there, but it actually looks somewhat normal. So one of the things we're going to learn here is that when p is close to 0.5, the sampling distribution of the sample proportion is actually going to be fairly normal for even smallish sample sizes. But what happens when we're closer to the boundary, when we're closer to 0 or we're closer to 1? Here I've kept the same sample size of 20. But the real value of p is actually 0.1. And what we see for the sampling distribution of p hat is that there's actually some right skewness here. There's some right skewness. It's skewed to the right. And similarly, it's mirror image over here. When n is 20 and p is 0.9, when we're close to 1, we've got this skewness over here to the left. So when we're close to the boundaries, then we get a little skewness in there. But that skewness is going to go away as we ramp up the sample size. So let's leave these proportions the same and increase the sample size and see what happens. We get this type of thing. So sample size is 100 now on both sides, and we get something that's a little more normal. There's still a little right skewness over here. And there's still a little left skewness over here, but it's much more normal. So even when we're close to the boundaries, if we have a large enough sample size, we're going to get something that's approximately normal. The central limit theorem is going to help us out here, just as it does in many other spots. Now, there are some guidelines then for when we have approximate normality, but different sources say this in all sorts of different ways. So I'll let you consult your, your own textbook to, to see what they say. But some points to note here, major things, for large sample sizes, p hat will be approximately normally distributed. And the closer the true value of p is to the boundaries of 0 or 1, the larger the sample size that will be required to get that approximate normality. Let's construct confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. I'm putting this up here, our standard deviation of the sampling distribution, just because we need that to work through a little bit of the logic here. And I want my uh, confidence interval for my parameter p confidence interval for parameter p, so I'm going to start off with my best guess, and that is simply going to be p hat. 
And if we have a large sample size, then we have this approximate normality and we can construct the confidence intervals in the usual way. We simply plus and minus our margin of error. And our margin of error is going to be made up of our usual Z value, Z sub alpha over two. I know it's hard to show the alpha and the two, they look similar, but that's Z sub alpha over two as we've seen before times the standard error of p hat, times the standard error of p hat. So this form is pretty similar for us. A couple of major points to note, we are never going to use t here. Proportions aren't going to use t. It just doesn't work that way mathematically. So we can either do this as a z, or we'd have to do something else, but we'd never have a t in here. Now our standard error is the usual type of thing. Our standard error of p hat is our estimator or estimate, depending on the context, of the standard deviation of p hat. Ideally, we'd love to put this thing in. Ideally, I'd love to just drop down, that down in here, but I don't know the value of p. And I don't know the value of p, that's fine. We're gonna put our best guess of the value of p in there, which is simply p hat. So our standard error of p hat is going to be the square root of p hat times one minus p hat over n. Just our true standard deviation with the real value of p replaced by our sample proportion. Let's talk about hypothesis testing now. And I put this up here again because there's an important point to make. If I want to test the null hypothesis that the true parameter value p is equal to some hypothesized value, well, we're going to have our z test. It's going to be a z test. It's not going to be a t again. So we've got our z is equal to, we take our estimator minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error of this estimator. However, it's a little bit different in hypothesis testing than it is in confidence intervals. So I'm gonna have a little subscript here denoting that this is for the test, the standard error for the test of p hat. Ideally, we would put this in here again. Ideally, I would drop that into the denominator, but I don't know what this is. So you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, let's just put the p hats in like we did for the confidence intervals. And that would hardly be a crazy idea, and that's a pretty reasonable notion. Except we run into something that we do here in statistics. It goes right to the heart of how we think about hypothesis testing. What we do is we construct this test statistic to have a known distribution if the null hypothesis is true. We have this test statistic having a known distribution if the null hypothesis is true. And if the null hypothesis is true, then P is actually P naught. And so I can put P naught up here. So this differs from the confidence interval in that our standard error in a hypothesis test is going to be the square root of P naught times one minus P naught over N. In a confidence interval, we don't have a hypothesized value, so there is no p naught to put in there, and we put our best guess, p hat. Here, we want this test statistic to have this standard normal distribution if the null hypothesis is true, and if the null hypothesis is true, p is equal to p naught, so I should put p naught in there. A couple of points to note to finish. There are other possible ways of going about inference for p, including some tweaks that improve that normal approximation and exact methods that are based in the binomial distribution. But the methods we discussed here are quite commonly used, and we'll discuss an example of them in another video.